Hello and welcome back to the plasma physics survey course. Today is lecture 22 <clears throat> and we're going to continue talking about waves. That's going to be not just today. As you will remember from uh, lecture 21, we're talking about waves in a uniform and uniformly magnetized plasma. <clears throat> and we're looking at propagation of the waves along the magnetic field. And you'll remember that we've looked at um, left and right polarized waves, seeing how they actually turn as a function of time in uh, opposite directions, so that it um, makes perfect sense to call them as left and right polarized. One thing that <clears throat> I have not mentioned yet is that the convention that is used in um, our textbook and uh, plasma physics is to define the rotation of uh, the wave with respect to the magnetic field, not with respect to the wave vector with uh, how it's done in optics. Of course, in uh, optics, there may or may not be an equilibrium magnetic field. You're not dealing with plasmas. So there is only one meaningful direction, which is the direction of um, the <clears throat> propagation of the wave. In uh, this case, we have more than one meaningful direction. And the one we're going to pick as the reference one is the direction of the magnetic field. OK, now from lecture 21, we had ended up writing the expression for e for the perturbed electric field ex and ey in the two cases left and right or rather right and left polarized waves and uh, <clears throat> the next thing we want to do following our textbook is to look at the index of, of uh, refraction. <clears throat> and the index of refraction looks as follows. In uh, the first case, which is case number two, which is the one on the left in lecture 21, which is the right polarized one. And I don't know if I could have made it any more confusing if I had tried. But let's forget about everything I just said. We're going to look at the wave where n square is equal to r. And you have the definition of r from the previous lecture. And that's going to be equal to 1 minus the sum over the species of <clears throat> omega plasma for the species divided by uh, square divided by omega times omega plus omega cyclotron for the species. And Remember <clears throat> that I'm uh, using the definition of uh, the cyclotron frequency that includes the sign of the charge. In other words, that's not an absolute value. It's a quantity with um, a sign that's the sign of the charge. Well, then it's... Um, obvious that since the quantity is negative, when omega is equal to 
the uh, absolute value of omega cs ce we uh, see that the denominator of that expression goes <clears throat> to zero let's put this in writing Okay, let me try and do a little better here. When this happens, n squared goes to infinity. But that phenomenon is something that you have. Um, already encountered in uh, certainly more than one course in different branches of physics that is uh, resonance so what is um, happening well <clears throat> particularly let me call it with its name this is the electron, electron cyclotron resonance. So what is uh, happening here is that the electrons are rotating around the static magnetic field with the same <clears throat> uh, direction and the same um, the same frequency as the and the, the incoming wave and therefore the, the the wave can keep giving energy to um, the electrons now there is no um, no equivalent resonance for this wave for the ions because they're just rotating in the wrong direction and uh, in fact um, this type of resonance is um, quite important in uh, plasma physics and it is used as a um, tool to give energy to the plasma you can throw in a wave with the correct frequency and uh, that wave will just give energy to the electrons at, at the resonance <clears throat> the mm, the index of uh, refraction doesn't um, quite go to infinity if you use a more detailed model it just becomes uh, very large so the resonance is uh, is still there but it's not um, an explosive resonance that is a point where this theory breaks down and we need to include something more to have um, um, a better <clears throat> understanding of what uh, is going to happen okay so this is um, first important thing that we have learned today there is something more uh, happening you can see that if um, <clears throat> omega becomes um, sufficiently large um, well and reaches a value um, an appropriate value you can make um, that sum in the right hand side of um, our equation go to one and since the refraction index is um, square is one minus that sum term it can go to zero ok 
and add a certain um, spelling. Okay, what is then the physical uh, meaning the, um, of the index order fraction going to zero? You've probably seen this in uh, other courses or, already, <clears throat> but um, I will remind you that what the uh, that condition represents is a cutoff. Cutoff is a condition where our wave stops propagating. And um, therefore, it's cut off from continuing to propagate in uh, our medium. in particular in the plasma. So this cutoff is called, sorry, uh, this thing is being stupid. The R equals zero cutoff, okay, not a lot of, um, creativity here, but this is well represented, uh, uh, representing what is happening. And uh, as you'll see in our textbook, you can get a <clears throat> good numerical value for this cutoff. And as it happens, the frequency is going to be high, actually higher than the electron cyclotron frequency and so high that you can uh, pretty much neglect <clears throat> the um, ignore the motion of uh, the ions and if you do that you can uh, <clears throat> easily calculate an estimate of um, the um, uh, of the res, uh, sorry, of the cutoff value for the frequency. Now I'm not going to spend the time to do that. But I'd rather talk to you about the physics. What happens here is that the wave becomes evanescent. What that means is that instead of oscillating, it decays exponentially. Remember, our wave is defined by a wave number and the frequency and um, an index of a refraction. What happens <clears throat> In um, when the index of refraction becomes imaginary, is that instead of having e to the i something t that gives you an oscillation, you have e to the minus something times time that gives you uh, an exponential decay, or in space, depending on how you look at it. That's what happens for the right polarized wave. The discussion for the left um, polarized waves. is pretty similar. We're not uh, going to, to spend too terribly much time 
in discussing it, just notice that since this we change the sign essentially in our in our equation, the resonance is going to be at the ion cyclotron frequency. And uh, <clears throat> if you have more than um, one type of ion, of course, you can get more than one resonance. And uh, you're also going to have evanescent um, waves in uh, certain regions. Again, I encourage you to, uh, to look at the um, uh, at the plot in uh, in our textbook. Okay, so that's uh, mm, uh, what um, happens, and we could go into more detail, but I rather not spend um, another few lectures going into more details about these waves. I hope what we said is enough for you to start um, understanding how to describe and um, model the behavior of uh, waves in a cold magnetized plasma and you can take it from there and read about um, more waves. There are several important waves in different branches of physics. I will not get, get into those for a reason of time. We have, I think, six or seven lectures left. And therefore, we'll, we're not going to talk about uh, Whistler's. Or Whistler waves. Those are important in the uh, upper atmosphere. Can they, they can be detected on the ground. They're um, pretty uh, important discovering um, the history of uh, what wasn't yet plasma physics. The discovery, as you can see from our textbook, happened more than 100 years ago. So we've known about these for quite some time. So sorry about um, the part, but we... Um, Unfortunately, again, we have to make some choices and uh, we're going to skip this topic for um, our discussion. And instead, we will look at the other case that is the transversal propagation. Instead of waves that instead of propagating along the magnetic field, propagate across the magnetic field. So that's going to be our next topic. And those are also in our uh, textbook a few pages um, later. Well, let's get started then. All right. Our starting point is the tangent form of uh, the dispersion relation. But let me put a little separation here. And let's talk about
perpendicular propagation. So here what I'm going to do is um, to set the angle theta equal to pi over two which means that in this case, the sine of theta is going to be equal to one and the cosine equal to zero as opposed to the opposite for the parallel propagation. And let's put a little block around here. Okay, if you do that and work out the algebra that's, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. You get um, the following dispersion relation that I'm going to take from our textbook again, and I just uh, lost. So let me find it again. Left the pages flip. <laughs> All right, I just want to follow the notation and uh, symbols of uh, the taxes. Okay, our dispersion relation looks like this. Remember, when I say dispersion relation, I don't only mean the polynomial equation that we're going to get for n or n square even, but I also mean the matrix form of uh, the linearized equations. Here, as usual, EX in Fourier space, EY in Fourier space, and EZ in Fourier space. Take dot product, and this is going to be equal to zero. And therefore, we set the determinant equal to zero. And obviously, there are again multiple solutions the easiest one is uh, n square equal to p and the other one is a little more messy You need to uh, work it out using some definitions that we have encountered in the uh, previous lecture, but this will give you that n squared is equal to r times l over s. But again, all the quantities are defined in a sticks notation. I don't think I've ever spelled out Mistake, so. It's a good name to know. It's somebody that <clears throat> gave a great contribution to the understanding and uh, the teaching of um, in this branch of, pl of uh, plasma physics. Okay. You can immediately see that in this case, the Fourier transform of the magnetic field is going to be of this type. It's only going to have a Z component. While in this case, it's going to have everything except the Z component. And you can easily work out one way or the other, you set either the X or the Y component to E naught and work out the uh, other one as a function of it. Now, the first case should hopefully look familiar.
because it's exactly the same as uh, in the unmagnetized case. What happens here is that the magnetic field that is static and constant doesn't do anything to the particles and therefore the, the wave because the particles are moving parallel to the magnetic field and therefore as we have seen before v cross b goes to zero or at least v cross b naught goes to zero but that's the only term that we need to keep in our uh, uh, description the other piece is mess oh i should mention you will encounter this notation this mode is called the ordinary mode or o mode since using full words is always um, struggles for us and it's called the ordinary mode because it's i i believe because the dispersion relation as we said is the same as the unmagnetized case Phase two is more complicated and is known as the extraordinary mode. Oops. And of course, the abbreviation for extraordinary is going to be X. extraordinary because it's not ordinary not nothing nothing much uh, more than that to it okay now in this case we're going to have zeros and poles for the, the refraction index and here is how they go you can uh, have either one of r or l going to zero that's going to give you a zero or pulse when the denominator goes to zero that is s go goes to zero and uh, i will not try to reproduce it i'll just uh, ask you to go look at the figure in our textbook figure 427 that's going to show you where the resonances are and uh, where the the zeros of uh, the refraction index are and remember those zeros correspond to evanescent waves what you're going to see is that for certain values of um, the the frequency s goes to zero which means looking at our expression for the electric field that the x component of the electric field will blow up as compared to the y component 
remember the y component is the component in the direction of um, the uh, of k. So that's um, the x component is in our uh, textbook the direction of um, propagation of the uh, sorry the the wave the direction of the wave uh, number so the components that are aligned or uh, perpendicular to the wave number will assume very different ratios depending on where you are in uh, your um, frequency uh, range and between resonances and uh, cutoffs you'll have again an evanescent wave and uh, i'm not going to go into the the details of uh, of the, this description or write um uh, write out the um, dispersion relation and, uh, and expressions notice or keep in mind that the textbook shows the the plot of um, n versus omega under the assumption that there are two ion species in the system and um, the case you only have one there is one fewer resonance and uh, in that case the uh, the, the resonances are going to look like this you're only going to have two and uh, you can check the case with uh, multiple ion species in uh, the textbook in uh, the case with a single ion species you get the following that the upper hybrid resonance occurs at a frequency that is a combination or well the sum um, whose square is the sum of the squares of the electron plasma frequency plus the electron cyclotron frequency while uh, the lower hybrid resonance occurs at a slightly more complicated expression no, sorry that's the notation we're using omega cyclotron electrons square times omega plasma ions square all divided by whatever omega cyclotron electron square plus omega plasma electron square and i should emphasize that these are approximations they're not exact and again, let me type their names is the upper hybrid resonance and this one is the lower hybrid resonance and we have neglected terms of uh, <clears throat> of the order of um, me over mi or if you prefer omega plasma ions over omega plasma electron square
I should, uh, let's see. If the density, well, let me, let me take just this limit. In the case of high density, Um, omega plasma electrons is much larger than omega cyclone electrons. And uh, therefore the lower hybrid is approximately equal to omega cyclotron electrons times omega cyclotron ions. And uh, for low densities, you, you can work it out if you're unconvinced. then omega plasma electrons is much less than omega cyclotron electrons and therefore omega uh, lower hybrid square is approximately equal to the plasma frequency of the ions squared Those are the two limiting cases. Of course, in Tokamak, uh, you're neither neither one is uh, is valid. You're sort of in the range in between. I should um, well, I don't know if I should, but I will mention that the lower hybrid frequency is uh, pretty important uh, in. Um, fusion because it, it's used for a, a current drive if you want to run a current in your plasma you can do it in different ways one of them is to throw um, a lower hybrid wave uh, that is a plasma not a plasma wave an electromagnetic wave with frequency close to the lower hybrid resonance into your plasma and uh, keep in mind if uh, that wasn't obvious it's important to emphasize it but these frequencies the frequency of the resonance depends on um, the properties of the plasma among other the density and the density of um, any plasma be it um, magnetosphere um, you know an experiment on the ground or uh, whatever else intergalactic uh, plasma is not necessarily a constant and therefore and neither is the magnetic field and therefore <clears throat> that frequency will be a, a function of position which means if you want to use that frequency to do anything with your plasma you can if you know enough about the plasma you can point your wave so that it will interact with the plasma at a specific uh, location or at least in a specific region um, one additional thing that I will uh, mention is that um, there are some uh, standard ways to make graphs to represent um, resonances and um, cutoffs and let me make some space full disclaimer I'm not going to get into it 
a common way to represent cutoffs and resonances. is a, a diagram that's called CMA. From um, the names of some uh, scientists that, uh, well, I don't know which one invented it first. I don't um, have the direct references, but um, so the people that um, I guess worked on uh, on this topic and got their names associated with uh, with that, and you can find a description in um, section four point four point four. Well, let me write it down. Uh, so first, let me write their names that I have to. Copy because I'll never get them right. It's Klemov, Mullali, Alice. Mullali. And I don't know how I don't even know how it's pronounced. Everybody calls C M A. C section 4.4.4. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about this diagram. And, um, you know, this will be possibly um, reasonable. I don't know if anybody's going to get here before we have to decide on topics for the final project, but this will be a reasonable uh, topic for the project to do something on, uh, on this diagram. If you think you're going to work on waves, you you may even be already familiar with it. Um, just deciding. Let's make a bigger division. Okay, that is all for this topic. And now we're going to move to something still related to waves, but slightly different. Well, I should uh, mention that this is not what we're going to do next is not done this way in our textbook. So pay attention, but it's um, what we're going to discuss. It should be relatively or reasonably understandable. What we're going to talk about next is thermal effects on um, uh, plasma waves, or I should say on waves in plasmas. Non conventions, never get them right. Okay. Let's see, where would we worry about um, thermal effects and what what do thermal effect thermal effects actually mean? Well, we've been um, neglecting in, uh, in short the plasma pressure. That's what thermal effects is going to mean. And what we're going to do next is actually uh, take that into account. Where this is needed is, first of all, close to resonances. And you can see how that is going to be important in uh, plasma physics. Remember, we said at a resonance, the index of refraction goes to infinity in this model, which 
tells us the mode is the, the model, not the mode, is breaking down. We need to include some more physics, and that physics is thermal effects. And um, it's also going to matter when the refraction index is very large in general, is much larger than one, even if you're not quite at the resonance. The approximation of neglecting the plasma response in terms of um, thermal motion is valid when the refraction index is close to one. And that's what we've been, at least implicitly, doing, even though that was not necessarily the case for all the results we've uh, found. OK, now what we are going to do in the time we have left today is to use fluid equations. And that is um, part of the reason why it was important to talk about fluid equations before we got to waves. Notice that um, very mathematical, very rigorous treatment of uh, waves in hot magnetized plasmas can be done using kinetic theory, but we haven't really told all the much about kinetic theory. We never wrote equations for the distribution function. And um, that leaves us in the position where we have to, to decide uh, if there is anything we can learn without getting through the, um, the, the steps of learning more about um, the distribution function. That would be great, but that is not necessarily the most um, expedient way to proceed. OK. Enough for justifying our approach. This is what we're going to, to do. We're going to take our fluid equations, and I should say linearized fluid equations. Okay, two more points to notice to uh, to state before we proceed. First, we are going to start from the unmagnetized case. It's going to be a little simpler. And let's start working on the momentum equation. Now, the momentum equation is uh, something that hopefully by now you're familiar with. For each species, I'm not going to put um, subscript, but it's going to look as follows m times n times dv dt and here I'm going to put a 1 this upper term v is equal to n times q times e1 minus the gradient of p1 I hope you can uh, appreciate the uh, all the information that is included in what I what I wrote here, and uh, I encourage you to pause this for a moment and uh, think about it. 
but here's what you can immediately tell we have assumed by writing that equation as our linearized equation. First, there is no equilibrium velocity. How can you tell if there was equilibrium velocity, I will have, and I'm not talking about particle velocity, I'm talking about fluid microscopic velocity, the velocity of a fluid element. If there was um, an equilibrium velocity, I will need to write um, a term for the Lagrangian derivative, the um, for the, the time derivative that includes the piece v dot gradient of v, and I should linearize that. I will have something like this, order one. And maybe this is something we can look at in a class or at, uh, at a different time. Uh, what else am I going to assume? I don't have B1. Mm. What does that what what does that tell me if um if anything? Well it doesn't really tell me all that much because Sorry, it doesn't do what I wanted to do. And this comes from the fact that there is no equilibrium velocity. So if I had a V0, V cross V0 plus V1 will be a first order term and I will need to keep it. But what about V1 cross V0? Well, that will be will need to be there. Or where by V, I mean J. Well, there isn't um, there isn't a magnetic an equilibrium magnetic field, or I would have terms of the type v one cross b zero. So those are our assumptions for um, this derivation. Oh, and uh, let me remind you that we've actually. Kind of already said that when I said that we were looking at the unmagnetized case. But we can recognize it from the equations that we're writing. Now, let's take one more little step to remind ourselves of how we do this. In general, perturbations are written as as follow as follows, and let's just put in the pressure P is going to be equal to P zero plus P one, where P one is much less than P0. And uh, you will notice that I've not solved the 
equilibrium momentum equation in general you will have to because you will need the equilibrium quantities to work on your perturbed equation the equilibrium quantity is going to appear are going to appear in the perturbed equation but in uh, this case without equilibrium velocity and without magnetic field equilibrium magnetic field there isn't really anything for the pressure to do so the pressure is pretty much a constant there is no other force p0 is a constant that makes it uh, easier but that's kind of special case well i put in the pressure there and uh, you'll remember pressure is always um, a bit of work we need either an energy equation or a closure i really dislike calling this an equation of state it's not what it is okay but um you'll um you'll find that what i'm going to do is take the adiabatic closure and i'm assuming, assuming I'm going to assume that um, p um, so again p over n to the gamma is a constant From uh, this is it uh, trivially follows. Well, I don't know if it's trivial, but this I can rewrite as p times n to the minus gamma equal constant. I'll just call it c, or uh, if you prefer p zero and zero to the minus gamma and this is going to be equal to now finally introduce my perturbation p0 plus p1 not pi p1 times n0 plus n1 to the minus gamma and uh, uh, well what i'm going to do is just do this product sort of i'm actually going to do is do a taylor expansion remember n1 is much less than n0 therefore wow well, okay not a straight arrow again okay therefore n0 times one plus I mean zero to the minus gamma sorry one plus and one over and zero to the minus gamma is approximately equal I can do the Taylor expansion to n zero to the minus gamma times one minus gamma and one over n zero just do uh, keep the first order expansion while p0 plus p1 well this is actually equal without approximation to p0 1 it's p1 or p0 because the uh, first order expansion of a linear function in p1 <laughs> is of course the function itself and now I can do the product and, and now it's easier to um, identify well it's actually possible which I couldn't quite do before to identify first order terms p0 plus p1 times n0 plus n1 to the minus gamma is going to be approximately equal to p0 and 0 to the minus gamma times 
one plus p one plus over p zero sorry times one minus gamma n one over n zero and is equal to p zero and zero to the minus gamma times one plus p one over p zero minus gamma and one over n zero minus gamma p one over p zero times n one over n zero which is a second order term and therefore negligible So that's what we have, but remember, this is actually also equal to P zero and zero to the minus gamma. That was our original assumption up here that this quantity is constant. And uh, that is a condition that's not violated by our perturbation. In fact, oh boy, do I want to get into this? Maybe not today. <laughs> but in fact, that's the assumption we're making specifically for the perturbation. A different assumption may be true for the equilibrium, and that's okay. You can uh, have different closures for the equilibrium and uh, the perturbation. Long story short, because it's time to close today this um, the uh, today's lecture this must be equal to one which can only happen if p1 over p0 is equal to gamma n1 over n0 and that's my first result now What uh, what what is really so useful about this is that I can express the perturbed pressure in terms of the perturbed density, but I have another equation for the density that I've not written yet and will write next time. And that's the continuity equation. Um, some spelling challenges. We can express the perturbed density from the continuity, the perturbed, of course, continuity equation. And that's what we're going to do next time. Thank you for. Uh, making it this far into the lecture and I will see you for lecture 23.